Thank you, Brett. Uh, thank you, Mark, for the invitation as well. It's a pleasure to talk to you this morning. I'm reminded uh, why I like DC so much. It's not the White House and the museums when I come out here. I was walking back to the room last night, and the little flashy street sign says I have 65 seconds to cross the road. And if you come from San Francisco, we have about three and a half to four seconds to cross any road. And, and I've lost a lot of good friends who had no other fault other than they were five second crosses. So uh, when I saw 65 seconds, I stopped at email for a minute and then, then walked across the road. So. So I come to you admittedly from, from the dark side, from the world of over-the-top content delivery. And I, I look at, at broadcast with, as, as somewhat of magic. You take pictures and video, sorry, pictures, sound, and metadata, and you move it through the thin air. And you may look at us, and we take pictures, sound, and metadata, and we move it through these pipes and tubes, as you refer to. So both of us have a technology, and neither side quite understands it. And there's a fair amount of ignorance on both sides, of which I am a poster child. I came to the boot camp yesterday. If you asked me what was uh, Shannon's limit, I would have told you it's the maximum theoretical number of drinks your Irish girlfriend can have before you really should take her home. <laughs> so turns out it has nothing to do with that. So there's, there's ignorance there. It leads to claims on the over-the-top side, especially from bloggers in San Francisco, that over-the-top is taking out broadcast. This is absolutely not true. The largest web delivery we've ever done concurrent users, eight and a half million viewers. The Super Bowl, which you all did as if it were no big thing, 114 million this year, I believe. So we have a long way to go in terms of capacity. The interesting data there, however, is we acknowledge that it's only 8.5 million, but that peak concurrent is growing at about 60% per year, which means it's doubling every year and a half. To get from 8.5 to over 100, you only have to double four times. So realistically, in about six years' time, right when ATSC 3.0 devices might be deployed, we might realistically have a deployment system that can reach 100 million concurrent through the pipes. So that's, that's looking ahead. Equally on the broadcast side, there are those who look at the internet and say, this is not a medium you can do quality television through. It was built by CERN to send messages to each other. How can you honestly do UHD? So I have very little time today. I want to present some truth, some statistics that we can look at, and just one lie to you. And the lie will come right at the end, so don't interpret anything I say before that <laughs> as involved. So we, cannot, we can debate the future, but we, we cannot argue with the past. This is a bandwidth chart from Akamai. I went back exactly 10 years from today and looked at our traffic. It was 84 gigabits per second. We were proud of that. That was the largest in the world. I jump forward to today, preserving the scale of that chart. Today, we're doing about 26 terabits per second. 31,000% growth in 10 years. Okay, that, the, the prior chart from 2005 is so small, it's not even one pixel high there. Okay, and this is real established growth we've had. This is driven by video consumption on the internet. About 65 to 70% of what we deliver today is pure video, and that fraction is increasing. As we go to UHD, it's going to increase to an even greater amount. Now, if you're reasonable and you're an engineer, you say, well, if that was the linear growth rate over the last 10 years, what can I look forward to in the next 10 years? At least it should be the same. There's many reasons why it might even be greater, UHD being one of them, new technology being another, Moore's law continues for us. So what happens if we go forward with the same growth rate and look at what it might be in you know, 2025? We'll collapse down there. There we're looking at 8.3 petabits per second, which is the same as sending 8.3 megabits to a billion people concurrently. Now, if you look at me and I shake my head and go, wow, that's unrealistic, and you may say the same, but honestly, that's no more unrealistic than if I'd stood in this room in 2005 and told you we'd do 27 terabits. It's the same ratio. So it's, it's, there's not a clear path to get there with today's technology, but there's a rational expectation that we will get there with the route that we followed. And notice that the fundamental structure of the internet did not change between 2005 and 2015. HTTP, TCP was effective enough as an architecture to scale from 86 gigabits per second to 27 terabits per second. So Akamai, we, we don't like to project 10 years ahead. This is what we're planning for by 2017. We're looking to do 70 terabits per second across our network. We're the largest CDN in the world. We're not by any means the only one. We deliver between 15 to 30% of all internet traffic. So we're certainly the dominant CDN, but there's a lot of traffic that's moving outside of us. I'm going to fly through some slides because we can look at it. World Cup traffic. This is some of the peak concurrent views 
you'll notice over there we had almost seven terabits per second for a single game. So if any of you, you have done your online delivery, we're now looking at a single event consuming seven terabits, almost a fifth of our average network capacity at any one time. This brings a lot of problems out for uh, architecting, because how do you handle these ridiculously high peaks? Before that game, we had seven terabits of idle capacity sitting there that we were paying for, and then it got absorbed during the game. And just to show you how the peaks move, the World Cup was mid-2014. Look at Sochi, Russia. My point is not, not lasering, right? Uh, Sochi, Russia, that was in January, February. So we already had a three to four-fold increase in peak traffic just from January over to July of the same year. And you can look back at World Cup from South Africa forward. So as we look to Summer Olympics next year, you can expect us to easily get over uh, 10 to 11 terabits per second for a single event such as the opening ceremony. So I'm going to present some data today. You should always ask, where am I getting this data? So Akamai makes public at akamai.com slash 60 seconds stats from across our network. Um, if you look at just one of these, we serve 2.9 billion HTTP requests every minute, which is about 60 million a second. And we measure the throughput on every single one. So the data I'm showing you is coming from a cohort that we believe is fairly representative of the internet as it's getting delivered, certainly with with sample sizes like that. So how fast is the average connection in the United States? Anyone want to hazard a guess? It's in megabits per second. I'll give you a clue. Okay. So here's the real data for the last seven years. Today, it's about 11 megabits per second. Now, this is from Florida up to Alaska. This is connected televisions. This is handhelds. This is wireless devices. It's a national gross average. But we can clearly see the trend of where it's going today. And when we can layer on top the type of adaptive bit rates that we in the over-the-top world do, 500 at the lower end, maybe 7 megabits for 1080p today. And you'll see that the average bit rate now is really climbing to a margin where we can quite comfy, comfortably deliver good quality content. And I'm talking today, good quality is 30 frames per second, 1080p, or certainly we'll, we'll look at higher quality than that. There's a lot of rebuffering. Everyone's had it. So this is by no means the, the magic number. I'm just... My point in showing this is that, yes, it's not unrealistic that we can start delivering at the 1080p level. Peak connection speed is interesting. So what I showed you was the average. The peak is an indication of the theoretical throughput available in your connection when it's not congested. Notice that's going right up in the United States to 50 megabits per second. So we're doing a great job in this country, especially in the last five years. You'll see the rate of growth of throughput has really risen dramatically. And this is what is enabling video content delivery to become far more successful uh, commercially. And now if I put on those same thresholds, you see the peaks again are way higher. How about the United States compared to some other countries? You'll notice the United States actually at the lower end. If you're in Japan or South Korea, you're looking at double to three times the average throughput that we have here. When we look at where our UHD service is going to deploy, they're going to deploy at the upper end of this curve first. Here's average connection speed, again, for several uh, countries uh, in Europe, because it's always interesting. I was talking to DVB, and to compare it with ATSC, the United States is actually doing better than uh, Central and Southern Europe. There's a big divergence, actually, if you look here, between Northern and Southern Europe, which is quite interesting. Why should there be a geographical variation in bandwidth? There is a geographical variation in the United States. So here's our plot of all the states and their average bandwidth. And you'll notice that the higher throughput, which is the, the green and the lighter colors, is on, on the sides. And you know, very generally, in the center of the country, there's lower throughput. I don't know if you ever looked at a map where you thought, you know, why is it like this? I won't go into the social side. I have more on that later. How do the states vary for connectivity? So actually, Virginia, number one, if you're interested. Uh, New Mexico, the slowest state by average. But all of them have seen a concurrent rise or an aggregate rise in throughput in the last five years. So we're doing a good job at uplifting uh, the national average for throughput. Now we can start looking at 4K or UHD. And there, again, in the OTT world, we're looking at 10 to 20 megabits per second. We're assuming HEVC usage. And you can see that. Mm, some of, some of the average connectivity certainly would, would be good for that, but certainly there's a lot of people who fall out of that uh, threshold. So here, um, double animation. 
So we actually plot something called UHD readiness, and actually we, we picked the 15 megabit per second threshold, and it's, it's a very rough metric, but it's saying if you average 15 megabits per second today, then we have a reasonable chance of maybe delivering you UHD. We might have to buffer a fair bit at the start, we might have to store and forward, but it's a good metric to, as an indication. So we're plotting now on the vertical axis percent. What percent of users in these states reach that metric? And you'll notice that the bar is pretty low now. It's about 15%. But it's not zero. And 15% of 240 million people is a good audience. So we, that's why you see Netflix. That's why you see Hulu. That's why you see Discovery Channel and a bunch of uh, other content owners starting to experiment with some portion of their catalog at UHD size over the top. And you can afford to experiment very easily over the top because you don't have the requirement to deploy a new tower. You don't have to deploy terminals that talk to each other. You can do these one-off experiments very quickly and very easily. And that's one of the advantages that over the top has when it looks at new technologies and their adoption. So we can do some simple high school projections. Here's that same average connection chart that I showed you uh, previously. We can draw a straight line out and we can try to guess what the average bandwidth is going to be at the end of 2015 probably be about 15 megabits per second. We go out another year, 18, and maybe by end of 2017, we're looking at 23 megabits per second. These are rational projections based upon the last five years. Now, the curve actually may look more like this, because remember, we have Moore's law, we have technology, Cisco's making faster routers, uh, and that gets more interesting. So we're comfortably out of the OTT range for delivering HD, and we start getting into a very interesting area where Maybe within 2016, 2017, the national average is high enough that the, that fraction of the audience to which we can seriously consider streaming UHD content at 15 megabits per second or more uh, will be large. Other browser stats. This is interesting to me, and, and we're changing subjects from throughput over to something MSEEME. You may have heard those words. They, they came up in the boot camp yesterday. What they represent is an opportunity to establish a common player framework. What I want to show you is, is in the browser, again, these are all the browsers hitting our network. Look at how dominant Google Chrome has become uh, recently. This data is taken from February of this year. And plotted a different way, here are their browsers, and I bracketed them with the ones that support MSEME already. So 50% of the web already supports this today. This means we have the underpinnings of a common player framework that we can use. And diversity of these players has always been one of the problems that plagues OTT. And these same players can play inside televisions, and there's a big initiative to make it work that way. Um, so this is happening today. So what are the forcing functions then? What threatens our over-the-top future, and, and what brightens it? So on, on the threatening side, obviously the arrival of UHD. It's hard enough to do it with broadcast. It's even harder to do it over one of these pipes or tubes. Um, there's a large audience that is shifting viewer consumption. We'll have other metrics, I believe, on the speakers today that, that, that show, you, show you that. People are shifting to device-based playback you know, outside of the living room, in their bedrooms, on their devices. They're moving around. That's a challenge for us because we have to reach them with connectivity. It's great when you can plug your RJ45 into something. It's harder when there's Wi-Fi. It's harder when there's cellular delivery. And increasing user expectations of quality because broadcast sets an extremely high quality bar that the over-the-top world is forever trying to catch up with. And then peering point congestion. Again, the congestion in the internet is not at the edge. The edge is relatively uncongested. I heard a great quote from someone who was talking about getting Fios deployed. And they say, if, if you deploy fiber to your home and expect that to increase your, your average internet throughput, it's like saying I'm getting a wider driveway and it's going to reduce my commute time to work. Okay. So we have a problem. Peering point congestion is something we need to uh, solve. But Cisco today will sell an 8 terabit per second router. You know, Akamai's total traffic is 27 terabits. So just you know, four of those routers will, will, will happily switch all of our traffic. So it, the technology exists today. It's just the economics for the ISPs to pay Cisco the money to deploy those routers have to come about. The economic pressure to do that is video delivery. And that is happening. Now what's on the bright side? So just like you, we're looking at HEVC. HEVC allows us to deliver more video through the same pipe or improve the quality for a given bitrate. We'll certainly use it like that. Average throughput growth, we saw the charts. It's been rising for the last five years. It's going to continue in that path. Backbone fiber improvements. 
In February of last year, they demoed 250 terabits per second down a single strand of fiber. There's about 250 terabits per second of total internet traffic on Earth at any one time, obviously not during that test. But the fact that you can deliver that down one fiber means the backhaul that is connecting all the data centers, the underpinning, the web of the internet, has sufficient capacity to deliver an HD stream, certainly to everybody in the United States at the same time, as long as these technologies get deployed. Hybrid UDP protocol. So we, today, Akamai unicasts over TCP 99.9% .9 of the video that you see there. That is going to change because that is not scalable. We're already looking at, at UDP uh, for a lot of improvements to maximize the pipe that we're, we're flowing through. And what we call hybrid protocols, where we'll, we'll try UDP. If it doesn't work, we'll fail down to TCP. IP multicast is another one. Multicast has been around for, for decades. Why isn't the internet using it for delivery? The answer is that there's no global standard for IP multicast. Every network is deployed separately. You have Juniper routers, you have Cisco routers, you have different settings, nothing is interoperable. So Akamai has to do the hard work of going out to a network, convincing them to allow us to participate in the IP multicast strategy. So it's a business and it's a technical challenge to get it out there. But we'll certainly make use of it. There's enough pressure today to leverage IP multicast. P2P had a dirty taste in everyone's mouth from BitTorrent, which is unfortunate because as an architect, P2P is a very effective distribution solution. Your nodes for distribution rise in proportion to the audience you need to serve, and then they go away magically when the event is over. You don't pay for the capex and the opex to keep them running. So P2P is efficient, but P2P is also riding on the back of somebody. It's riding on the pipes and the, and the IT knowledge and the setup of an ISP. So the only way to make it work at scale is if your P2P solution involves the ISP, if it's actually good for the ISP's network. And why might it be good? Because it'll stop traffic peering outside of their network, which is something they have to pay for. So P2P done right and done in cooperation with an ISP is a very interesting technology for um, distributing, especially live video, concurrently viewed video. HTTP2, just like you've had a 20-year improvement to ATSC 1.0, the internet is undergoing an improvement from HTTP 1.1 over to HTTP 2.0. It's an improvement in throughput. That alone will give about a 15 to 20% improved throughput on a connection for large video files as we switch from 1.1 to 2. Akamai is going to deploy HTTP 2 across our network this summer. It will be the biggest deployment in the world of it. Standards. I'm a big fan of MPEG Dash. Uh, I'm a big fan of standards. Actually, Dash happens to be the, the best open standard for adaptive delivery today. But we fight the fact that there's four different ways to send adaptive media to devices. That means encoders have to divide by four the effort they put into any one format. Player builders have to build four different players. Televisions have this complexity of what to support. When we can all focus on a single standard, it doesn't have to be the best one in the world. It just has to be the fact that we focus on it, we agree on it, and we work together on it. Because the customer does not care what format we use to send video to the device. They care about how fast it starts, whether it buffers, and what it looks like. And then the decreasing cost of storage. And you might wonder, why, why does a media streaming guy care about storage? Storage is the inverse of bandwidth in our world. If, if we had infinite storage device on your phone, we'd just put all the videos there and never have to stream them. You'd get perfect quality. So that's an extreme argument. But the fact is we can trade off throughput by storage. We can pre-deliver content. There's a lot we can do. And the price of storage is going down through the floor. So we're going to start leveraging it more and more. In your home router, expects storage. In your television, there should be storage. In every appliance that has Wi-Fi connectivity and a power supply in your house, there should be storage. And broadcast integration. There's my happy face. I got a warm fuzzy yesterday when it was mentioned that ATSC3 is another IP pipe to a device. That's fantastic. Imagine you could broadcast Apple's iOS update. It's a one gigabyte file that goes out to 50 million people at the same time. It's a perfect candidate for a broadcast solution. So I hope we can work together on solutions like that. We are very interested in leveraging broadcast infrastructure to send files to people. Right. I know you want to pull me off, but here's my lie. So this is world broadband distribution. This is uh, the light areas are low broadband. The dark areas are, in fact, high broadband. And that was the lie, because that was not broadband distribution. That was GDP per capita. And if I plot both of them together, you'll see that they match each other. And what's interesting here is that a lot of people say, well, that's symptomatic. Poor people can't buy bandwidth. 
and they would if they could. But I argue, because I come from one of the countries that's in the super white area there, and that has low GDP and has no broadband, is it's becoming causal. The fact that you, if you want to know what the specific density of lead is, can ask your phone, it will tell you in three seconds. In any one of these countries, you have to walk to the library, look it up and walk back, that's three hours. Three seconds versus three hours is a big difference. It's a tax on the rest of the world. And we can see it in the numbers. So here's, I'm gonna compare India, United States. Some of you are from India. India has done great. The average connection speed has risen 217% the last seven years. The United States has gone up by 305% in the same time area. So we can look at the divergence in the rates of growth and that gap is widening. And that gap is even worse when we look at the last five years. And it's not going to change. That is not going to slow down. We are pulling away. So I know we spend a lot of time in, in all our businesses and in my own company by admittance on bringing UHD to maybe 20 million people. But there's another business opportunity that might be worth considering, which is bringing 720p to a billion people. And with that, I'll end it. I appreciate uh, your time today. The data I presented is all public, and you can access it uh, from these URLs. Thank you.